major funding for KPBS Evening Edition has been made possible in part by Bill Howe Family of Companies, providing San Diego with plumbing, heating, and air restoration, flood and remodeling services for over 40 years. Call 1-800-BILL-HOWE or visit BillHowe.com. And by the Conrad Prebis Foundation, Darlene Marco Shiley, and by the following. And by viewers like you, thank you. The future of public education in San Diego County is front and center tonight. Thanks for joining us. I'm John Carroll in for Maya Tribulsi. The annual joint meeting of the San Diego Unified School Board and trustees from the San Diego Community College District has just gotten underway. The education leaders are meeting at this hour to assess their shared goals and make adjustments that improve learning for a generation of students. KPBS education reporter M.G. Perez is live at the campus of San Diego City College downtown to fill us in. MG? John, we are here at the Seville Theater on the campus of City College where school board trustees are gathering and will be meeting for the next several hours. The San Diego Unified School Board represents about 100,000 students. Many of them go on to graduate and then attend campuses in the San Diego Community College District, which has more than 80,000 students annually. The face-to-face -face meeting once a year here gives an opportunity to those in charge to make school better for every student that they represent. Sagal Deep Gotra is one of those students. She is the student trustee representing Miramar College. She traveled to Washington in February with other colleagues to lobby Congress for more community college funding. Now she's an intern in the office of San Diego City Councilman Kent Lee, and she's a graduate of San Diego Unified, where she started her associate's degree. She wants more high school students to have that chance. By completing your associates in high school, that is a phenomenon that happens very often now. We just need our students to have the opportunity to take some classes earlier on. And I think there are students ready to take that. Right now, high school students can't start taking college courses until their sophomore or junior year. Sagal Deep is asking the joint board members to consider starting that academic path with freshmen. I'd like a motion to adopt today's agenda as published. The San Diego Unified School Board continues to process the reality of more teacher layoffs in the next school year in an attempt to reduce the district's projected $93.7 million budget shortfall. What will not be cut are programs that will assist high school students in continuing their education education in a college program. That's according to board president Shana Hazen, who is proposing to the joint board meeting tonight that a long-term assessment model be created to quantify the success and failures of students. When they exit San Diego Unified and enter the community college system, what are those things we want our students to be able to do and how can we better evaluate that? and develop plans and supports to help them do those things. And you are looking at the stage where this meeting of the minds will happen this evening. By the way, in my conversation with Shana Hazen, she told me that tonight's meeting is really an opportunity for both districts to reset as federal COVID funding starts to end and new opportunities and challenges for each district begins. John? Well, MG, as you were saying in the story there, San Diego Unified is having budget problems. So given that, will this joint effort be able to succeed? Well, John, as they say, it ain't over till it's over, and neither district will know for certain from the state until about May or June as to how much money they will receive. So for the moment, both districts are remaining optimistic and planning for the future. MG Perez, thank you. The county is honoring the late labor rights leader Cesar Chavez by kicking off a week of action. Today, county and state officials gave an update on the progress against wage theft in the past year. KPBS reporter Alexander Wynn was there and has the story. I knew I had the responsibility to hold this company accountable. 
for its actions. They promised. Choking back tears, her voice trembling, Santa Cruz described her ordeal with wage theft. She was cleaning short-term rentals for a company, despite promising several times to pay her back wages. It was only a few hundred dollars, but Cruz says that money can make a difference in workers' lives. But they don't know whether that day when I went to work, whether or not I had money to put gas so I can go to work. They don't know that. Cruz filed a complaint, but her employer was long gone. She eventually got her money through the Workplace Justice Fund program. The program was launched last December through the county's Office of Labor Standards and Enforcement. And in just three short months, OLSC has exhausted the $100,000 funds. The county says it's the first program in the country to pay up to $3,000 to workers who have won legal judgments against their employers. Cruz was one of 35 people helped by the program. Between 2018 and 2022, the county received nearly 15,000 wage theft claims. In that same time frame, the court ordered nearly $20 million to be paid back to workers. How much of that money was returned is unclear. Wage theft hurts more than just the employee involved. It also hurts other businesses and taxpayers. Supervisor Tara Lawson Reamer says when workers can't afford to pay for health care, they come seeking public health benefits, and that hurts taxpayers. Workers who are getting cheated out of their wages and they can't pay for rent, um, they can't uh, help uh, buy groceries, it hurts our entire local economy. Um, you know, it, it contributes to homelessness. San Diego County District Attorney Summer Steffen says her office takes cases of wage theft seriously because it often leads to other crimes. Wage theft and those abuses escalate to the point of being a, one of the most serious human rights violations of labor trafficking. That's when you add force, fraud and coercion to the wage theft and the wage abuses. Those who experience wage theft can visit SanDiegoDA.com to file a complaint or call 866-402-6044 to get help regardless of immigration status. Alexander Nguyen, KPBS News. The Supreme Court has cleared the way for state officials in Texas to begin enforcing a controversial immigration law. That law, known as SB4, allows them to arrest and detain people they suspect of entering the state illegally. It's raised concerns from critics over racial profiling. Forty percent of Texas's population is Latino. Today's decision only allows enforcement while legal challenges to the law continue in a lower federal appeals court. It does not set a precedent. San Diego City Council is expected to decide soon whether to extend the state of emergency due to January's storm. The declaration would allow the city to unleash funds it normally would not have access to. It would also make it possible for the city to qualify for state funds. Since January 22nd, many families have been forced to stay in hotels while repairing or finding their new home. Our media partner, KGTV, spoke with a substance abuse counselor who says the flood's impact isn't just physical. Residents are on edge, it's PTSD, um, and a lot of trauma. Our residents are sitting in the hotels and they're forced to sit with their thoughts. There are mental health resources available through several local nonprofits profits, and a helpline through FEMA. That number is 800-985-5990. It is free and it's offered in multiple languages. Southern California, jolted by weather the region doesn't typically get. KPBS environment reporter Eric Anderson says yesterday's storm gener uh, generated a lot of lightning. The National Weather Service says the storm lit up the sky with more than 1,400 regional lightning strikes. 650 made contact with the ground in Los Angeles and San Diego. A dozen lightning strikes is considered a lot. It had similar characteristics where there was a lot, lot of energy, meaning unusual weather to, to the casual observer, a lot of lightning, uh, strong winds. Thunderstorms that we normally see in other parts of the country happened in San Diego yesterday. And it wasn't just yesterday, it was on Friday. That's when unsettled weather brought hail to the county. Forecasters say the storms are unusual for the region any time of year. San Diego's marine layer gets credit for moderating local weather patterns. It's uh, stable conditions where the atmosphere is happy. Um, it's not excited. There's not much energy in the marine layer. Uh, so when we're dominated by that, that prevents us from getting 
uh, energetic storms like we saw yesterday. The storm system didn't do much for rainfall totals, which are hovering near average for the current rain year. But there is another storm in the forecast this coming weekend, and that could mean more rain and wind. Eric Anderson, KPBS News. Now, it looks like our clouds are back in the mix as we go throughout the next couple of mornings, especially along the shoreline, though. Overall, we're looking at a dry spell of persisting for the next uh, few days, but we do see some changes kicking in as we venture our way toward the upcoming weekend with uh, some wet weather back in the equation. I'll talk about that and much more with regards to our temperatures coming up here in just a bit. Tomorrow, we launch a very special project here at KPBS. It's an in-depth look at the child care crisis in San Diego. Six episodes will delve into the crisis using different lenses, parents, providers, and those looking to help. KPBS reporter Tanya Thorne brings us a preview of the series. Many of us parents feel like our village is lacking. From ages zero to five, many of us are on our own. That's where child care comes in. But the child care industry is in a crisis. Finding quality care that's even remotely affordable is really hard to do. I've been reporting on child care for years, and there was still so much I didn't know. So I went to find out more. I met people from all parts of the child care system. Parents looking for infant care. It's crazy that I feel behind and the baby is not even here yet. Families who get child care subsidies. We just helped a lot because we can't afford it. Um, right now, uh, being a disabled veteran, I was able to get a zero down loan for a home. Um, and then the price of everything from COVID went up. Inflation went up. A mom who says transitional kindergarten is helping her go back to work. And I remember that whole first day we were at home just worried, worried, worried. But he came out and he was like, I made this friend. I love my teacher. Do I get to come back tomorrow? Families with kids in special education. Most families who have a child with a developmental disability will tell you the fight to have their child included is a lifelong one. And providers who are trying to expand and pay a living wage. We've talked to a few like owners of properties. They're like, yeah, no, we're not doing that. We're not gonna do a daycare facility because that's just a lot of work. We'll try to help parents find their village because there are resources out there to help. And we'll look at efforts to change the system, both here in San Diego and on a national level. So come with us and find your village. And now I'm joined by Tanya to talk more about this. So Tanya, how did you decide to report on child care? Well, John, child care is a personal issue for me. Outside of news reporting, I am a mom of three little ones under five. But thankfully, my mom is my main child care provider. And thanks to her, I didn't need to leave the workforce to care for my little ones. But it's a topic that comes up all the time. We see it in news headlines, in the mom groups, at your local park. And I started to realize that it's a struggle many families in San Diego and nationwide are feeling. It's not just the cost anymore, although that is a big one, but now it's also securing a spot without landing on wait lists. And, uh, what were the most surprising things you learned? You know, I learned that I wasn't alone in feeling lost when it comes to finding out about child care. Doctors, when you're getting ready to have a baby, go over breastfeeding tips, car seats, rules against co-sleeping, but no one ever tells you about child care resources available. So parents who maybe don't have a village around them are surprised to find out the cost of child care that can be up to $19,000 a year and the lack of spaces. So I think the lack of communication when it comes to resources is finding out. I got something here from families all in San Diego. Yeah, uh, now I know we're going to be playing some of your stories here on Evening Edition in the coming weeks. Can you give us a preview of what we'll see? Yeah, so there are six episodes, and each episode follows the journey of families navigating the child care system. They range from a new mom just starting this journey, a family getting subsidized assistance, and how it's helped them, as well as a mom looking for child care for her son with special needs. But it also takes a look at the provider's angle and their struggles, the obstacles they face as they try to expand to provide more care for more children. Definitely a little bit of everything. 
It sounds really interesting, and I know it's a critical situation right now. Thank you so much, Tanya. And if you're interested in learning more, KPBS is hosting the Find Your Village conversation, complete with child care resources. That's coming up this Saturday. It'll be from 10 to noon at the KPBS Community Engagement Center on the campus of San Diego State University. Regular train service through San Clemente is set to resume on Monday. The railway was closed after rocks and debris fell on the tracks. Amtrak Pacific Surfliner restarted limited service earlier this month. But now, Orange County transportation officials say work to protect the tracks from additional falling debris should wrap up this week. That will clear the way for trains to resume their usual, usual schedules. California's goal to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by the end of the decade may be out of reach. That's according to a new report by the nonprofit Next 10 and Beacon Economics. They say it's unlikely the state will meet its goal to cut emissions by 40% of 1990 levels by 2030. The report says California can only achieve the goal if it triples its efforts statewide. According to the data, the state needs to reduce emissions by about 4.5% a year to reach the mark. It's something most of us rarely think about. You turn on the tap and water is there. That water comes to San Diego County from different sources, but it must all travel through pipes. I took a look at the high-tech methods used to inspect and maintain those pipes to keep the water flowing. It takes a lot of pipelines to get water to all of San Diego County's nearly three and a half million people. This story is about large diameter pipelines. This map shows the 308 miles of those big pipes running all through the county, delivering water to the San Diego County Water Authority and its 23 member agencies. So it's critical those pipelines are properly maintained. So these large diameter pipelines um are known in the industry as transmission pipelines. So they're like your, uh, your main arteries in your body. Sticking with the medical analogy, you might call Martin Coghill the lead physician when it comes to the health of this area's water transmission pipelines. His actual title is Operations and Maintenance Manager for Asset Management for the Water Authority. We met him off Sycamore Canyon Road in Poway within the Gooden Ranch Preserve. So there, there's visual, which is us climbing inside the pipelines and then also using video technology. Before heading to the area where the pipeline maintenance was happening, Coghill did a bit of show and tell, telling us the different ways he and his colleagues have of determining what shape the all-important transmission pipelines are in. And then there's uh, acoustics, and we have... Oh. Like acoustic fiber optic cable which goes in some of our pipelines. High tension wires shown in this cutaway picture of a pipe will snap if something goes wrong. The fiber optic cable then picks up that noise and reveals exactly where there's a problem. And there's another kind of acoustic measuring device. This foam ball, an acoustic leak detection ball. This goes inside this foam insert and um, the technology inside this ball can hear leaks as this flows through the pipeline. Back to the visual aspect, this device, invented by Coghill, he calls it Scanny. It makes high-resolution video surveillance possible in areas where it's a challenge for humans to be in the pipes. Some of them um, go through very steep sections and that requires specialist rope support for the personnel that are inside the pipelines. In other words, it's risky for people. With Scanny, you get the surveillance without the danger. And Scanny allows for us to lower the device with a, an array of seven cameras so that we can get the equivalent resolution from someone being inside the pipe done via the cameras. There's another device being used for this inspection. We find it at a pipe access point just down the road. It's this contraption, an electromagnetic tool invented by the company doing this part of the inspection, PICA, the Pipeline Inspection and Condition Analysis Corporation. This is quite an ingenious tool. They've used um, inflatable surfboard technology to make this tool. These discs are all put down into the pipe where a worker joins them together. Then they're inflated and the high resolution technology goes to work. The sensors will fit to the, the entire circumference of the pipeline. We can find the local uh, 
corrosion spots that might be occurring to the pipeline, within the pipeline. While they may seem small, with the pressures and the volumes of water that we have inside the pipeline, um, even a leak can be quite devastating. This work was happening in what's known as Aqueduct 1, comprised of one pipeline built in the 1940s and Pipeline 2 built in the 1950s. Pipeline 2 is being inspected now with repairs to follow. Then the older one is up next for inspection and repairs. So this condition assessment, which involves 15 miles, we anticipate will be complete in about four to five weeks. There are some other work going on in this pipeline to rehabilitate these structures, and that will take about a year. And so in a year's time, we will actually finish that um, rehabilitation work, and we'll switch the pipelines over. While we were shooting this story, Martin Coghill said something very interesting about this inspection, and that is that they wouldn't have been able to do it 10 years ago. The difference? Conservation by water users in San Diego County. The demands have come down sufficiently enough that we can isolate one pipeline from the other and just supply for this time of year um, using one pipeline. And so the work continues. The never-ending work of keeping the pipelines in good shape. The pipelines that deliver something no living thing on earth can do without. The elixir of life. Water. John Carroll, KPBS News. Now we do have some clouds rolling back later on tonight. The, the low cloudiness, especially along the coast, but even towards some of the interior valleys overnight, low temperatures dropping down into the mid 50s. Uh, we will experience some sunshine returning later on tomorrow, but it is after a bit of a cloudy start. Temperature wise, 70 Oceanside, Chula Vista topping out into the upper 60s, mid 70s in Ramona, and again, mid 80s toward Borrego Springs, Mount Laguna, some clouds around throughout the day. Temperatures topping off into the upper 40s. We'll walk you through, again, a future satellite and a radar, and there you can see the clouds kind of hugging the coast, but they will go away here, again, throughout some of the interior valleys. The immediate shoreline can see some of that cloudiness here at times going right into the afternoon, and we'll see a similar setup here as we work our way throughout Wednesday night and into a Thursday morning. But by the time we work our way toward a Thursday afternoon, I think there will be a quicker clearing trend. All right, uh, so let's talk about uh, the trend here as we work our way down the road. And again, to notice those conditions, again, looking uh, quieter after we get through, again, Thursday morning. Some sunshine on Friday. And then we turn our attention to some wet weather here as we work our way toward the upcoming weekend. Rain and drizzle again Saturday. Also, a couple of showers does not look to be a powerhouse of a storm, but it will definitely bring an abrupt change to what we're experiencing right now. Over the interior valley, similar situation, clearing skies here after a bit of a cloudy start to Thursday into Friday. We'll experience some sunshine temperatures here on the warm side, but then some changes for the weekend. Wet weather arrives and so the cooler air with temperatures dropping down into the 60s. Now taking a look at the, the mountainous locations, chilly the next couple of days, but as we work our way toward the weekend, we'll also notice some wind in the equation along with some clouds around. And as we talk about the deserts, and notice the 70s returning after a spell of 80s here Wednesday, Thursday, and into Friday. Well, for KPBS News, I'm meteorologist Justin Povick. Some good news for Padres fans looking for ways to watch opening day. The team says a cable or satellite option will be announced next week. The pods face off against the L.A. Dodgers in the MLB's first ever regular season game in Seoul, South Korea. It's a place near and dear to star shortstop Ha Seung Kim, who had this to say about his return home. Yeah, I'm really um, grateful and honored to be a part of something historical. MLB game has never been played before in Korea, so I'm really glad that I'm, I get to go back to my home country and play a major league game um, with these group of guys. I think I'm just overall excited to just show my teammates the whole country on um, the culture and how the baseball culture is um, over like in South Korea. First pitch for the home opener is set for 3 a.m. on March 28th. Korea Series games will be available to stream for free on Padres TV, and they'll also be televised on ESPN. Let the madness begin. The NCAA college basketball tournaments are about to kick off. And it's not just the men's games that will draw big audiences and big distractions this year. Karen Kafa looks at how the games could actually be a good thing for the workplace. 
Get ready for a lot of college hoops. The game has gotten so good. The players have gotten so good. The storylines have gotten so good. The coaches are amazing. Meredith Geisler, visiting assistant professor of sport management at the George Washington University School of Business, is talking about NCAA women's basketball. She says it's all driving more interest than ever in the women's road to the Final Four. It's all converged to make it so that women's college basketball and ultimately probably the WNBA as well has, has really emerged as a product that people want to see. That means the potential for even more exciting games that can distract workers. Every March, outplacement firm Challenger Gray and Christmas crunches the numbers on workplace productivity lost to games and brackets. Their 2024 estimate, not $9.6 billion. Whether they're researching and filling out brackets, they're organizing pools in their office, or they're actually live streaming those games during the workday, uh, people are going to be doing a lot of not work over the next few weeks. But Andy Challenger says the tournaments could also reap benefits for employers who have struggled with team building in an era of hybrid and remote work. There's all sorts of ways you can get people engaged, and it's a really fun and easy way to engender a lot of camaraderie and morale. In Washington, I'm Karen Kafa. The San Diego State Azte Aztecs men's basketball team will take uh, place on the University of Alabama Birmingham in the first round. That game takes place this Friday in Spokane, Washington. You can catch it on TNT or stream it on YouTube TV. Tip off is at 10:45 a.m. And of course, as always, you can find tonight's stories on our website, kpbs.org. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm John Carroll. Have a great evening. Major funding for KPBS Evening Edition has been made possible in part by Bill Howe Family of Companies, providing San Diego with plumbing, heating, and air restoration, flood and remodeling services for over 40 years. Call 1-800-BILL-HOWE or visit billhowe.com. And by the Conrad Previs Foundation, Darlene Marco Shiley, and by the following... by viewers like you. Thank you.